In computer programming, there are often multiple ways to solve a problem. How do we know which solution is the right one, and how do we compare one algorithm against another? In order to analyze the efficiency of an algorithm, we generally use a technique called big O asymptotic analysis. The definition of big O is f of x is in big O of g of x if and only if there exists a k and an x naught such that for all x greater than or equal to x naught, f of x is less than or equal to k times g of x. Easy, right? <laughs> well, let's dissect this to understand what this is saying and how this is useful. The big picture is that we're trying to compare how quickly the runtime of algorithms grow with respect to the size of their input. We think of the runtime of an algorithm as a function of the size of the input, where the output is how much work is required to run the algorithm. You can think of big O of G as a giant umbrella that covers all algorithms that are at least as fast as G. For example, pretty much every Pokemon is in big O of Slowpoke, since they're all faster but almost no one is in big O of Usain Bolt, except for Usain Bolt himself. As we pit algorithms in a race against each other, this will be a special kind of race with no finish line. Instead, we prefer algorithms that have a clear lead, where the other contestants have no hope of catching up. Because this race has no finish line, we will allow the contestants to cheat and start wherever they want, and even take performance-enhancing drugs to multiply their speed by whatever constant factor they want. Colloquially, this means that we only focus on the largest term in an expression and ignore all constants. So, we say that x squared and 5x squared plus 12x plus 37 are in big O of each other because they're the same when we ignore the smaller terms and constants. It may help to visualize each racer's performance on a graph, with the x-axis being the distance and the y-axis being time. We want the functions that stay the lowest as the distance grows very large, since that would mean that the racer got to that point faster than the other racers. By moving a graph down or squishing it, we can sometimes fit it underneath another curve, which is equivalent to adding or multiplying by constant factors. However, due to the shape of the curves, sometimes it's not possible to squeeze one below another. This is ultimately what the formal definition of big O is saying. There are many types of contestants in this race, such as algorithms with a linear runtime. Graphically, these runtimes look like a line with a slope. You can imagine it as a turtle that moves at a constant speed and never slows down, or a driving car that doesn't accelerate. While it may seem like the car is faster, it really has the same type of speed, linear, which we call big O of n. We can give the turtle a performance boost, causing its graph to squish below the cars. Since we can do this for all sloped lines, they all fall under the same big O. We can now imagine a train which can only travel on train tracks. We put an infinite amount of track material at the start, but there isn't any set on the race course. What this means is that in order to move forward, the train needs to go back to the start, pick up the next bit of track, move forward, place the track down, and repeat. For simplicity, we'll say that the train can hold one step length of track at a time. I won't prove it here, but in order to progress n steps in the race, this train needs a total of n squared steps, or a quadratic amount. A linear racer might seem slower than a quadratic racer at first, but as we get far from the starting line, a linear racer will pass the quadratic racer and his lead will grow forever. Even a performance boost can't make the quadratic racer faster than the linear racer. We can imagine slower racers, such as those that take big O of n to the third or big O of n to the fourth time. Often, we like to group together all algorithms that have the big O of the form n to the k under the term polynomial time, since the runtime is a polynomial function. The reason is that different computational models can result in different big O runtimes but a polytime algorithm will always be polytime regardless of the machine model. However, we can get a lot slower than polynomial time. Imagine a racer that is using the race as an opportunity to train. The racer will take a step forward at first, but for every new step, he goes back to the start, repeats everything he did before, and then takes the new step. 
the time it takes to make each new step essentially doubles every time, giving us a runtime of big O of 2 to the n. We call these algorithms exponential, and even if we kickstart them to begin quickly, they rapidly slow to a crawl. While we could find infinitely slower algorithms, there are some really fast algorithms to explore. For example, let's think of a racer that could teleport. What this means is that it will always take this racer the same amount of time to travel any distance. We call this runtime big O of 1, or constant time. This big O covers all teleportation, whether it takes 1 second or 1 million years. We can also imagine a rocket ship that accelerates faster and faster the farther it travels. With each passing unit of time, it could travel twice as far as it did before. This behavior is the inverse of the exponential algorithm. This is big O of log n, also known as the logarithmic function. So far, I've been talking about increasing the input size like it's the only factor on the runtime, but the runtime of an algorithm often depends on the specific input. Some inputs can cause the algorithm to run better or worse, even if they're the same size. For example, if you're trying to find a Charmander in a pile of Pokeballs, you could get lucky and find it in the very first Pokeball you open, which is a constant time operation. But sometimes, you have to search through every single Pokeball before you find Charmander, which is a linear time operation. It's often helpful to separate an algorithm's runtime based on what happens in the best case, the average case, and the worst case. But we usually take the pessimistic view and simplify an algorithm's runtime to its worst case behavior. Big O is also useful beyond just looking at an algorithm's runtime. We can use it as an analysis to how much space an algorithm is using, which is especially important if we have hardware constraints or are operating on very large sets of data. We can even use Big O asymptotic analysis on problems themselves, showing that it's impossible for any algorithm to solve a problem faster than a certain runtime. While Big O is important and certainly useful, it isn't the end-all be-all. Big O erases constant factors, but sometimes those are actually important. When we want a program to be performant, such as a video game, a programmer will try to save every bit of computation even if it doesn't change the Big O runtime. Also, we think of certain runtimes, such as exponential, as bad, but if we know our input will always be small, it might not matter. Sometimes, we might even intentionally pick a solution that has a worse big O, because other factors matter more, such as readability of the code. What big O does teach us is that sometimes, slow and steady doesn't win the race.